Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Olga. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Very good. Thank you. It's very sunny and beautiful getting warmer in Boston. Oh, I love Boston. Yeah, I used to, I've been to Boston a couple of times a long time ago. It's a beautiful city. Yeah, gorgeous. I'm glad. It has yeah. A farm. Yes. You you probably have similar although I know your winters are colder than ours here in the UK, but just today it's starting to warm up for us as well. It's been a bit rainy and always does in England and and but the sun is starting to come through and it's warming up. So yeah, I'm very grateful we're moving towards summer soon. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Well, I'm I'm really super excited to talk to you today um because I know you do some amazing stuff. Um but before we get there, I'd like to know a little bit about your background. So would you please tell us a little bit about you? Um, where were you born? Have you moved around? You know, obviously you live in Boston, as you've just said. Uh, what about your schooling, education, any, any jobs, any career? And then how did you get to what you're doing today, which obviously is the fascinating bit that we'll hear about later. So over to you, Olga. Yeah. Um, words of English I was able to say hi my name is Olga I'm from Russia I have a mother and a father <laughs> <laughs> so yes I've learned German at school so it was like a big transition of understanding another language um, but it was a very um, interesting way of learning life and everything because I literally became a child and I learned English picking up everything from outside whatever people were saying i didn't understand but then you know little by little um yeah. I learned english um, my first job in america was actually um i the nine months since i came to america i worked at jc penny at yes. color me beautiful counter so i was helping women with the makeup so oh, that wow. was my first job yes the second job when I moved to Boston like a few months later I worked uh, um, at the center of Boston at Lord and & Taylor and yeah. I was selling um, Estee Lauder cosmetics yeah and after that uh, with my immigration status I lost it um, I had um, lost my work in Pyramid so I did work as a nanny and then that moved me into being a preschool teacher in the um, very elite um, uh, school preschool in Boston as well so right. from there it pointed me to having my own children um, it was um, it wasn't it was very great experience for me that I actually worked with um, American children and American uh, psychology. So I was, it was so much easier for me when I had my own children uh, yeah. to move from that space. And no, I knew all the rhymes. I knew all the songs, all the books. <laughs> and that's how I learned English. Actually, I learned English from children, which is Brilliant. the most amazing way. You say something wrong, the kids are saying, you're not saying that right. <laughs> yeah. so, they would point to every mistake you made. Uh, but it was a great way for me to, to learn that uh, this children level, you know, the child yeah. level. So, yeah so yeah. yeah almost like then, you know small steps like little children steps to learn a different language yes and, yeah i mean i can't imagine what it must be like to not be able to speak any english and then th that must have been quite scary right how did you communicate with your husband you know, at first through the uh, translator, you know, those, remember we had those, like, you write a word and yes. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the really? special translators. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, well, I, I went, I started studying right away. I came um, uh, in like literally 
a, a week later or something, I started going to Boston. But it was another part of it, which is I was supposed to take. So my um, he he wasn't even a husband at that time for me. Um, so he he would take me to the um, train station. From train station, I would go to Boston. From Boston, I would take um, um, the subway to go to school. And then the first thing when I came to school, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to learn English. I was shocked that there was no Russian teacher who speaks actually Russian and explains to you things in English. It was all in English. And the teacher would laugh and say, ha, 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 Russia is bad. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, she was just making fun and kind of giving that language, you know, yeah. when you learn um, but it was just, it was so funny. And at the same time, when I came home, I was shocked. I was shocked. I was terrified. The teacher wants me to say things, which I have no idea how to answer. So when the shock kind of went away, I, I kind of relaxed into that because all other people were not Russians as well in my class. So and that's kind of made the difference for me. I was like, okay, nobody knows anything else. I'll be okay. <laughs> so, oh, yeah well i've done. been in the united states now for 24 years so now wow. you know how <laughs> yeah so the balance is you're more american <laughs> than you were russian but you, you obviously never lose your heritage oh um, i think i'm something in between i'm not american and i'm not russian and sometimes i'm thinking who am i <laughs> yeah. i'm a global citizen <laughs> That's what I call myself now. You and me both. Uh, I mean, I'm a Dutchman. I've lived here a lot over 40 years in England, mm -hmm. but I still have my Dutch passport. And um, yeah, you you become neither one thing or another. And when it comes to the only thing that I'm, I I don't really watch football or as we as you would call it, soccer. I don't really follow it in, in the United Kingdom, but the only time I'm interested in football or soccer is when it's the World Cup and it's the Netherlands are then in the, you know, the running and or the European Cup where the Netherlands are. And then I'm interested. Then I'm a Dutchman again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then when when the Dutch go out of the competition, but the English are still in, then I then I support England. <laughs> So it's really weird. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, so the the last job you talked about was at preschool with kids and learning English mm -hmm. and everything else. What happened after that? Well, there was a crazy event that happened to me during that time. At twenty seven, I had a stroke. So it was. Wow. And in its own, it was a um, very scary event, but at the same time, it was an um, event that moved me into a different way of living and thinking. Not at that time, but looking back right now, what I know now and what happened to me at that time that I couldn't understand or explain um, on a spiritual level. And I was a Christian at that time, um, kind of a little bit like scaredy cat Christian, being afraid of God, you know, the judgment and everything. Yes. Um, and after that, I, um, two years later, I had my own children. Um, so from the preschool teaching other people's kids, I went into a motherhood. So I was a staying at home mom for about eight years then i started coming out of the house um, i decided to go and help other people which i work ever since i work for one family i'm a home care aide for like six years now for a ukrainian family uh, with um, alzheimer's and cancer so wow. and i'm kind of um it's an it's a difficult environment to work with in, but it's also uh, very rewarding to yeah. me. So I love to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so when did the stroke happen, did you say? I was 27 years old. 
And did you have your children so I, already by then? No, two years later, actually, when I had oh. my first child, um, I uh, my hospital is Mass General Hospital, which is like this really amazing hospital where like all Harvard doctors go to. There are all, all the stars of uh, medicine are there. Yeah. Um, we have other uh, great hospitals as well, but Mass General is one of them. And uh, so my neurologist came to um, my room to congratulate me, actually, when I had my first child. So everything went well. Um, my problem was, um, it was very difficult. Uh, my stroke was misdiagnosed because I was too young and then they couldn't find the reason why I had it. And then this amazing neurologist, he found the reasons that I have some malfunctions in my lungs, uh, where the, uh, veins would not go into capillaries and there are some spots that I call them holes, but it has them. It's called HHT, which I won't be able to <laughs> tell no. you that the name of it because it's like a crazy um uh, medical uh terms um so i had the um, kind of a whole big hole in my lung and they they patched it they you know i had to go through like heart surgery because at first they thought i had a heart murmur so i had to go through yeah. heart surgery then from heart surgery it's like it's a crazy experience on its own to experience but mm. what i um I can relate myself with, I can relate myself with uh, old people. I can relate myself with crazy people because I thought I was going crazy when I was not having, like I had some shadows because I lost after the stroke, I, I lost my peripheral vision on the left side and both eyes. So I saw these shadows moving around and I thought I was going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that was, um, that was on its own, very interesting spiritual and physical experience. So I'm very connected to how the brain works and how our body works as well. Yeah. And did you have any lasting or do you have any lasting physical ailments as a result of it? So I still have some little um, nodules or whatever in my right lung that had been monitored. Um, and I also, so I lost peripheral vision, as I said, mm. um, and I lost orientation, which is in its own, like on its own, it's kind of metaphor what happened to me later in life when I lost a vision and orientation of my life. Right, right. So okay. That, that is, it took me actually a while. I actually just put it all together only a year ago. Right. How that related to what later happened in my life. Mm. So it was almost what, well, let me ask the question. Do you believe what happened to you was like, um, a, a, like an, like, um, a physical sign or some kind of um because you call it a metaphor of what happened in your life later on but you got the notification of what might happen physically a year in advance it is it, yes it is interesting how we look in at our life and the difficulties that we go through, mm. it feels like we have this veil of inability to see what really is happening. And the only yeah. way we look at it is afterwards. Yes. Later on in life, we say, if that did not happen, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Yeah. Isn't it that? So that's kind of, it's not new to me. It's, it is worldwide spread, yes, yes. Uh, phenomenon of our um, physical experience on this, on this earth. So if you listen to any, if you hear any um, motivator, if you hear any healers or anyone, they have their own story, how they got to the place there yes. right now, which is through some hardship through some sickness, through some loss. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I agree with you. And in fact, I mean, 
where people discover that they may have some talent or knowledge that they then want to bring to the world as a result of these events in their life. I also believe even people that don't then bring that event alive in the rest of their lives is that any suffering that people go through, there is a, there is a, a shift that takes place and it's unavoidable. What I mean with that is the shift is going to take place and it may happen at a younger age or it may happen as it did with me in my mid forties, which was, a, I wish it had happened earlier to be honest, <coughs> but it happens whenever it happens. And when isn't, that it shift, 40s, isn't it forties, this amazing, weird, magic, awful time. <laughs> The midlife crisis, I definitely yes. had it. It was 100% on time. Yes, and, mine too. <laughs> and the thing is, we, everyone's going to get it at some sooner or later. It's, it's going to happen. But the important thing is to recognize it, right? And to kind of go, okay, what's going on and, and doing something with it? Okay, so I'm, I, I want to come back to your stroke and then your your two babies and being a mother and so um just want to go back to the chronological bit um oh i just i just want to mark that i want to come back to the time period of the stroke and the loss of orientation that then became a metaphor in your life because i want to bring it back when we talk later about quantum healing and quantum physics uh, as well. So I'm just saying that out loud that we're going to cover that in a second. But tell me what happened then after you became a mother, you had your two children, you, you stopped working presumably at that time or mm -hmm. what, what happened next in terms of any career or development or anything else? So um, when I had my first child, I had a very wonderful nurse, um, obstetrician nurse. And she told me when I was leaving the hospital, she said, you know what, be careful. Um, staying at home moms, they, they tend to um, lose their identity. And I was like, me? No, come on. I'm such a creative person. You know, I'm an actress. I am very creative. I <clears throat> uh, design and make clothes from scratch. You know, I paint. I do all kinds of things. I was like, me losing? No, no, no. So, um, and there I was. Two babies later, um, I was very... I was keeping myself busy. I really was connected with the nature. I spent so much time in my garden. I <clears throat> was very active at my church. I sang in a choir and we, have, we had an enormous church. Um, and I was a, a leader, um, worship team leader with children in kids town for three years. So mm -hmm. I was okay, but I was not okay inside. And it really, came to the point where even my ex-husband was looking at me and saying, uh, <clears throat> you have not done a shit in your life. And I became this moth that have not done a thing. And at the same time, I had to move every day with the routine of taking care of the children, taking mm. care of the house, and me kind of got onto the back burner of like, and I got to the point where I was really in a dark place. Yeah. And I was asking questions, which is, again, it's like world spread question when people get into the dark point. I would, <clears throat> and everybody call it the, the dark uh, night of the soul. Yes. Where I was sitting and I didn't know who I was. I did not know why I'm here. I was asking, who am I and who God is? And I was, I was angry. I was, I was sad. I was alone. And the God that I knew going to church every day was not there, like was not present. No. I was alone. So that's where I, that's where I got myself into. <clears throat> 
And that's where the transformation began. Wow. And you said ex-husband. Um, was this your first husband that you had the kids with? No, no, no. This is the no. second husband. So my first marriage was, it, that is like the, another whole story in the book on itself, <laughs> you know. Um, no, it was a very short um, marriage. Um, I was very young, opinionated. Um, uh, it was very difficult to connect with the culture, um, yeah. just to jump in, you know, into the culture. And I was supposed to get married <clears throat> by the, the, the visa that I came on. Um, yes. I um, was supposed to get married in three months. So we knew each other and talked on the phone for like six months before I came here. Um, what, the month before I came to America, my brother was killed in Russia. He was 24 years old. Oh. I came here and it was just this shock of everything. And yeah. even though I'm not, like even with death itself, <clears throat> I deal on a very different level than other people. Um, and I actually am dealing right now with the loss. My, my very beautiful young cousin, 38 years old, just passed away yesterday. And that shock of the loss of this energy of that person who was here, now it's gone. It's like nowhere. Yeah. So yeah. I was dealing with the loss of my um, um, brother, we were just a year and a half apart. We were very close. <clears throat> and it was all the crazy 90s in Russia. So the decision, my decision that I made, like lots of people ask me, would you, would you do that again? I, I would do that again because I, there is just was no other way for me to explore myself, to explore life, to explore everything that I know right now. Mm. So... Okay. I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I'm still a tiny bit confused about, I mean, you don't have to answer this question. It's none of my business. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to put the puzzle together. So the two children you have, what was with your first was, husband? No, no, no. That was, it's my second husband. So second yeah, husband. The first marriage was very short. Very short. Um, okay. Had problems with immigration. Yeah, uh, that's But it. everything worked out and I knew I have to stay here and, you know, give life to, so, to this country. <laughs> so when you referred to your ex-husband, even your ex-husband said, You've, you're not doing anything type of thing in your life. Was he the first one or the second one? <laughs> the second. No, that was the second. So the first one, the book is closed. Gone. Closed, 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 put on the shelf. <laughs> the right, whole right. story is with my uh, um, uh, other husband. Yes. Okay. So um, see what happens. And I'm, I mean, I'm not blaming him for anything because lots of mm. things hap happen with, um, I would say, Many women, when they are uh, staying at home moms and the husband is climbing up the corporate ladder, doing their, his job, and that seems so important because he supports the household. Yes, that is yes. very important work. But then your work seems less important. And that happens with many women whose husbands don't understand that the <clears throat> enormous gift that they have which yeah. is the mother and even like right now that I'm going through loss of my cousin she has seven years old girl left mm -hmm. behind and now the husband has to figure out how to live life without her how to yeah. provide for this girl what she had when the mother was around so yeah. so what happened was um my marriage kind of deteriorated in a way that it was like parallel living with my ex-husband. He had his life, I had my life, and we yeah. didn't cross anywhere in between. And that part of me, um, when I started going to the therapy, I found out that I had abandonment issues, um, that trauma from the childhood that I did not know at all that such a thing exists, yeah. um, just because when I was a year and a half, my mom, um, I had ear infections, uh, lots of ear infections, and we very often ended up in the hospital with 
this problem and my mom had problems with work um, so she um, sent me away to my grandparents when I was a year and a half, which was very young age to yes. be separated from the mom. And I was there for a year, for about a year. I was a year and eight month old. And then I stayed with my grandparents until I was three years old. And right. that separation brought this trauma into my life. So for me, for a person who did not have that trauma, for them, it would be probably normal. And this is how um, my church treated me. People from the church, they were saying, look, it's normal. So what you don't have uh, <clears throat> intimacy with your husband, it's normal, everybody have that. Um, he's a good father, he's a good provider. He, is, he cares for the children, he cares for you. Why are you getting divorced? I le lived with that trauma every single day of my life mm. not first of all it was like kind of poking at my wound every day mm. and the only way I could see to to stop that pain is to get divorced because yeah. through therapy we, we did go to the therapy and um, I just saw that there is nothing that we could fix um, and I had to, I had to go into a different level of my life. I couldn't yeah. bear any longer where I was and where I was going with, with all my life. So yeah. yes, I was the one who said that I want to divorce. I cannot live like that yeah. anymore. Yeah. And it was kind of a relief for him because he had already his plans for his life and his future. Um, and I'm very grateful to him for giving that um, opportunity to me to actually do that because it's kind of empowers me that I was the one who uh, took that step to do that. Yes. Because if that was otherwise, I would feel again abandoned and not wanted and not needed, not loved, um, which is that's how I felt in, yeah. uh, in the many years of my marriage. Yes. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you for that, Olga. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm really sorry about your cousin, about your brother and about the, you know, the loss of the marriage as well. Um, when these things happen, we, we, I'm talking about the marriage in particular, not about the passing away of your relatives, but when a marriage, you know, doesn't work out, in the moment, it's it's painful, but in years later, we realize at some level it was a gift, and you know. So I I, I know exactly what you mean. All right, so um, there you are, a single mother with two kids at some point, um, struggling recovery of stroke and various other things. What, what happened next and how did healing come into your life? So my healing actually started when I decided to get a divorce. Um, I absolutely did not know how to start and, and where to go. I have a very wonderful friend um, from Israel who does... Um, um, allergy elimination technique. Um, she's very spiritual. I called her and I asked her, could you please help me? I don't know where to begin. Can you recommend me any book to read? Because I had no idea how to yeah. go about it. So the, the only thing she told me, she said, here's what I want you to do. I don't care how many times you do that. Do it as much as you can. Go to the mirror. Say, she's like, don't think about who you're saying it to. Just say, I'm sorry, forgive me, I love you, and thank you. So when I had done that, it was an amazing experience. When I looked into that mirror, I cried crazily because I saw my soul looking at me with my own eyes yeah and that was the beginning of transformation and healing wow um it was so powerful that 
I, my heart space opened up and that's what I worked. And that's what I recommend everyone to work on a daily basis with this space in your heart. So going through divorce, uh, we actually, I asked my ex-husband if we can wait for one more year because my younger kid was eight years old and he was just a, such a happy uh, child. I wanted him to, to, I didn't want him to go um, at that age through all of this. So I asked him to wait for one year. So we lived together um, and we knew we we're gonna get a divorce uh, and we had to, you know, um, act accordingly in front of the kids. Um, and we actually, we were always good to each other. We never disrespected each other uh, in front of the kids. We never argued. Um, it was just that one moment when, when I said I want the divorce. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what I did, I would sit in my backyard and I would check in with my heart. If it's anything tense in there, I would listen to high frequency music. This is the thing that I found. I found these little videos, five, seven um, videos long that would transform my thinking in that moment. And then I stumbled on high frequency music. So I would plug it in and I would work with my heart. Then um, I Googled how to see auras. And I was amazed that I was able to see auras by the, you know, Google recommendations. Um, I was amazed and it felt like magic to me. I was like, oh my gosh, we can do that. And then little by little, I started getting information here and there. And once I was driving my kids to, to school, I was coming back and the, the, you know, I, my kids went to school in Lincoln, uh, in Massachusetts, which is this farm uh, landscape kind of farmy place. And I drive through um, Lincoln and I'm saying, looking up to God and I'm saying, this is not enough. This is not enough. Like I want more. <laughs> what is more out there? And that's what I have been getting um, for four years now. I've been learning so much and I'm still so curious about everything. What we have not taught at schools, what we have not taught at churches, what we have not taught in the families, which yeah. is who we are not as physical beings, because we know all about that. Yes, the doctors will tell you everything <laughs> where, where yes. things are and how it works, but who we are as spiritual first and then the physical, because that's what happens in life. If the spiritual is not addressed, the physical suffers. And yeah. we usually do the opposite. We do the, let's address the physical. So, and then we're going to go to church for Easter. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so yes, absolutely. Okay, so this is this is fascinating, and and thank you for sharing all that and how you, you know, started to evolve yourself and started to get interested in the non-physical, um, which, which is what I think is the only place for healing to take place in the non-physical. Um, and I would say, unfortunately, still most of the world is focused on the physical side of things. Um, and that's why it was interesting because you are about quantum healing and I, when I hear quantum, I hear quantum physics, I hear quantum mechanics. And when I first became aware of quantum physics, and started watching videos and educating myself and watching things like what the bleep do we know and you know really getting into it i started to realize that in quantum physics nothing is linear right it's all upside down it's all wrong in the wrong place it's all happening at the same time you know there is no timeline as such there is no such thing as time <laughs> And when you were talking about your um, 
your eyesight issues in terms of periphery vision and and that was a metaphor for what then happened later in your life and we kind of said oh so it was a physical warning for something that would be uh, a non-physical event later on in your life well actually it was all at the same time it just happened that the physical happened first that was all Mm -hmm. but there is no such thing as linear time in quantum in the quantum world therefore you know we think that things happen in linear. Okay, this mm-hmm. happened and then this happened. And, you know, I'm asking you questions about, okay, tell me about what happened first. Where were you born? Where have you moved around? Have you done to school? And the, 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 because we all think in a linear way. And it's almost, I'm now rethinking that question. I said, that's a stupid question to ask because it doesn't exist that way. Um, so I'm sorry for the listeners and people viewing this and from talking nonsense. Go and study quantum <laughs> physics a little bit, even a little bit, um, and you'll be you'll you'll get what I'm talking about. So once you've started can educating, I, can, I interrupt you? can I interrupt you? You actually yeah, go it, go uh, for it. Oh, I never answered the question because I do go kind of like okay, the question is starting here, but I go all over. So in Russia, I did study economy and um, uh, accounting. So that's what I was. That's what I studied right. in Russia, and I did not finish my bachelor's degree, and I was going to actually transfer into. Um, from the in the university after my associate's degree to um, psychology, I was always interested in that. So yeah, going back into our timelines on this earth. Yes. Um, but I was gonna give you an example because even before I before I found out what I know now, I had an amazing experience, and we do it. We do it even not knowing. Um, we create magic and create such events that uh, like pop out our eyes, which was when I was pregnant with my um, first child, I was seven months um, um, pregnant. This friend of mine who I knew and used to live with, she was actually from Ukraine, she um, appeared from nowhere six years later I have not talked to her for six years there she is appeared at my doorsteps asking for my egg to share with her because she couldn't get pregnant this is an amazing story so before I got pregnant I have zero negative blood type and I was always scared when I was a young girl um Um, I kind of knew that zero negative blood type is very dangerous for uh, pregnancies. So, so this, um, I I prayed to God to have, before I I got pregnant with my first child, I prayed to God to have this healthy pregnancy. So the baby would be okay. And the term I would carry to the term, um, whenever I open up the Bible, like I would just open it up and wherever my eye would lay land, that would be for me. And for sure enough, here we go. I am opening up the Bible and the first words I'm reading. And there was a woman in Israel who was elderly and could not conceive, but God told her, don't worry, stop drinking wine, stop eating any fruit from the vine and you will have um, a baby, don't cut his hair. And it was the Samson's um, birth. So I was like, yes, no wine, no grapes, no raisins, nothing. And there I was. And when this friend came to my house, I was in shock. I understood that it was, that word was not for me, but for her. So she, at that point, she already had one treatment for, I'm not sure if it's called in vitro or something like this. She already had this expensive treatment to multiply her eggs. She was... 42 at that time so her eggs weren't multiplying and she was uh, going to do the second treatment so when she came to me I was like oh my gosh I'm a young girl I'm not elderly I don't have problems that was for you of course you will get pregnant don't worry so I gave her the bible I um 
what, what I know, I, I will tell you, I did not know anything about it at that time, but I gave her so much hope. She went home and she got pregnant and doctors were in shock. So wow. when they called her after second treatment, they said, I'm so sorry, your eggs are not multiplying. She was already pregnant. So her daughter is a little bit younger than my son right now. Wow. <laughs> so that I still did not know how that happened because I thought God did that. It was a miracle that God did that. Mm. But when I learned metaphysics and how our mind works, and then later on, what my gift is, when I speak to people, when they come with their problems, when I put it in a different um, <clears throat> vibrational state of their mind, everything like unravels like this, everything just happens and shifts instantaneously. So, mm. and that's what happened with her. She literally walked out of my house and got pregnant. <laughs> Brilliant. So that is one, yeah, that is one amazing uh, way of explaining metaphysics, even when we don't even know how that works. But when we yeah. act accordingly to uh, metaphysics, we have miracles. Yeah. And that is, that is the reality. The trouble is, Olga, we want the physical evidence, don't we? We want, it's like people going to see mediums and mediums tell them the stories from, you know, beyond the grave or people in heaven and go, oh, yeah, I see this old gentleman and he's here to say something. And and we we all people crave this, this. They want to know about the unknown, but yes. they're also scared of it. They're afraid, but they yes. also don't believe at the same time it all happens at the same time they want it they kind of wish it to be true and they also don't believe it so how do you convince people in the work that you do with them that this is real so one thing that i do i use sound reiki which is see a lots of things what happens with Thing us is happening on the level that we are not seeing, which is mental and energetic, because we don't have just one body, physical and spiritual. We have no. layers of the bodies that are around us. So what I do with people, I work first on the, um, al aligning their energy grid first. So all the negativity and everything that is stored in their mental body, in their spiritual body, I clear it and align it to the frequencies of love and wholeness. So usually people gravitate to this knowledge and to this um, um, wanting of, of being whole, yes, with mm. all the problems that we have. Um, and then I'm very good at convincing people to hope for something different what they have. So those individuals, um, and I actually, I chose my niche to work with women, but strangely enough, I have a lots of um, men friends who um, I work as, a, as friends and they have this amazing transformation because they believe so people who believe that there is something else that they can do, um, it, it's, I always call it, um, you know, I co-wrote a few books. Um, and when I tell my story, my life story, it feels like there is like no choice or stay here or be there. But I always say there is a third option. Always, there is always a third option. And that third option is not to be scared of this option and don't choose the bad options that they have, but go with their own option. And their own option is to believe that there is something bigger, greater, and different than we already know. So that unknowing that we want to know, but we want the physical proof, 
if you go with that vibration and that's what usually happens with people who I work with, I literally yeah. give them that hope that there is something else and there is another way that you can deal with your problem. And that's what, that's, that's how they believe. Wow. Yeah. That, that's good. That's, that's incredible because you're effectively re reprogramming their belief system. I guess huh, what I'm what I'm curious about because I've seen people's belief systems change successfully. However, it doesn't always last, right? And it doesn't That's, last. Yeah. It doesn't last because they lose faith. Because if it's not instant, well, it hasn't changed. I've walked out of the door, and nothing's changed. So nice concept, Olga, but I need instant results. I have no time, you know. Um, so why isn't it happening to me? So people are impatient and they want it to happen immediately. So how do you help them with that impatience? So it's not even patience. It's, again, um, that ignorance of not knowing who we truly are, how mm. our uh, brain works. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. So you need to learn about your ego and how that works in you, how it protects you and how you can become the master of your life, but not the ego driving you to the choices and thoughts that you have. So when you master that part, when you find out that ego is here to protect you, but it doesn't have to because you yourself can do that. So, and yeah. there are very easy techniques where you can put your ego aside and say, you be the observer and I will be the master. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your help. <laughs> I'll take over from here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? Take over from the ego. Well, I take over for, for my life from here now on, and you can stay and observe what I will do. Right. Got you. Okay. So who I'm okay. Sorry. Maybe I'm being a bit thick, but who are you saying you can observe? To the ego. To the because ego. Because our right. ego okay, is very it. smart. Yes. It's very smart. It's usually a role, um, rules our life. But when you as an observer, will observe your ego, you will see how it works, what tricks it has for you, how it always worked in your life. When you notice that, when you find that out, and you will say, you know what, since now on, thank you for helping, thank you for being my friend, thank you for protecting me, but now I will take care of things myself. Yeah. And the yeah. ego says, oh, okay, she doesn't mean me anymore. All right, I worry too much. So fine, go. And but you have to work with that understanding every day of your life until yeah. you do uh, until you master that, until you really become the master of your life and your mind. Yeah. And I've I love it. I've so I studied this recently too, and I know how tricky it is. The way that I had it explained to me was, you know, when we're children, uh, we love our toys, don't we? We play with our toys. We have cars for boys, cars for girls, <laughs> dolls for boys, dolls for girls, whatever. It doesn't matter. But we have some sort of toys. And at some point in our life, we go, ah, oh, we don't really need those toys anymore. I'll keep one or two just for prosperity, but I don't need those toys anymore. They've served me well, and now I don't need it anymore. And that's the same with, the, you're calling it the ego, but it's the, the what I call, which is the same thing, perhaps, the conditioned mind, you know, because our minds are conditioned by our parents, by our grandparents, by our teachers, by society by politicians by just carry on by society at large our mind has been conditioned and we have conditioned it as well 
So when you observe your conditioning or you observe your ego, then you notice why you're reacting in the way that you're reacting. And then you go, ah, that's interesting. I reacted in that way. Why did I react? Okay, I must pay more attention and catch myself before I react in that way. And ever since I discovered that, only in the last like 18 months, I've been noticing more stuff about myself than I've ever done in my whole life about my conditioning. And yes, a lot of it does come from our childhood, childhood when we were younger, because that's when we're the most perceptive, where we copy and where we learn the most. Um, okay, great. Thank you. <sighs> you mentioned sound Reiki, didn't you? Yes. Tell me how that does that work? What kind of sounds do you use? Do you use? Yeah, over to you. <laughs> so we have um, in our body, we already have coded sounds. And that's why we have, when you listen to the music, some music is really helping you to relax. You love it. Some brings joy, love and all of that stuff. And then some other music that creates uh, weirdness within your mind body and everything like you cannot listen to that yeah. so we already have encoded musical system within our body um so there are some sounds i use my voice um to um ground to open up the energies so what i do is i literally when I go through all of your energy system, yes, I check what's, what's within it. I tell you what's within that um, by numbers, how much negative things you have in each of your chakra. And yeah. then um, I use my voice to ground those energies. But I also am, I am the vessel. And God takes care of all of that. So I ask God to take care of all of that, move it out of your, uh, of your energy system and fill it in, restore it with um, the love frequencies, with that wholeness that we were born with as children. So to go back into that restorative mode, um, what happens after that, we still have to. So I would take care of all the energies that you had stored within you from the moment you were conceived, actually, from the moment you were in your mother's womb. Mm. What happens after that, you do need to learn about your brain, as we talked about right now, because then, um, well, I teach you how to protect your energy field because we, not knowingly, again, there is so much ignorance in life because we haven't taught about our spiritual bodies and our spiritual selves. So we walk around the world, we go to the offices, we deal with our family members, with our friends, with people outside, uh, social media. Our energy field is open for anyone to come and interfere. So after I restore that, I teach you how to stay protected, how to protect yourself on a daily basis so other stuff will not come in. So, and that this is the most like exciting moment for me when people will know they will not need me every week to do the energy uh, clearing because they can do it themselves. They can protect yeah. themselves because we are sovereign beings. We are sovereign beings until yeah. we claim that sovereignty. And with that technique that I uh, teach people, they stay the, the sovereign. So... I've never, thank you, because I've I've never heard that phrase, we're sovereign beings. I love that. That's really, yeah, yeah you're right. It's very powerful when you f know that, because you mm. think that there are influences outside that influence us, and I have, I can't do anything. You can, you can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And when you say you use your voice, do you make because you say you sing, you earlier on you said about singing. Mm -hmm. So do you make 
different sounds with your voice depending on what energy you're clearing? Um, so the there are just two sounds that are ah and o. Oh. Right. And with my voice, when I do that, I open up and I ground. Um, there are specifically, there can be also other variants depending because the higher self knows what needs to be. It's not always the same with every client. It no. can be different, different length, different, um, 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 what is it? <laughs> now I need musical, musical uh, terms. Yeah, it can be higher or a little bit lower and it depends on the, the client. Right, right, right. And is it, is the sound a long sound like ah? Uh, or... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are long sounds. Yeah. And do you get your client to also make the sound on? on no, that? they just, they just literally just, they're just there to be taken care of. That's yeah. how I would say it. <laughs> And do you do this only with a client physically in the same room or do you do it over Zoom? I do it over the Zoom as well. Yeah. Metaphysics yeah. is amazing. You can do it. Um, you can do it wonderfully now through Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I, Olga, you know, I can talk for hours with you I about know. so many things, but you mentioned before we started recording that you've got an, another exciting project on the horizon. Would you like to share that with us? Yes. So we, um, all of us, all our problems and everything, as you mentioned, starts from the childhood. And mm. there is not one person who have not had some kind of trauma in the childhood, during the childhood. So I am so excited to be a part of the project. Um, of the um, uh, collaborative book called Transform Trauma and Thrive. Um, I am co-writing it with amazing people, with I call them gurus of our time, um, Joe uh, Vitale, uh, John Gray, Marcy Shimov, um, John Demartini, uh, some other people. So I'm so happy to be invited into, the pro into this project and be a part of helping people to learn how to transform their traumas, their childhood traumas and um, thrive in life. So oh, yes. love it. So it's going it. to be, I think I believe it should be out in May because I just, Oh, that's it. quite, Oh, that's yeah. soon. Yeah. Well, do keep us posted on that. And, you know, although the show will be out before May, um, I can always go back and add it to the show notes as well sure. okay sure. so i'll put a note on it saying coming soon <laughs> and yes. then we can put a link on it when it comes out mm -hmm. um so is there i've got two more questions well actually mm -hmm. one question but before i ask that question is there anything about your work that you do today that you haven't you wanted to share but you haven't had an opportunity to share us yet so um, the interesting thing that I, when I've learned about energies and as we talked about the brain, I also have been a student of Marisa Peer, which is she teaches rapid transformational therapy and I'm in the process of getting certified with that, which is going deep into your subconscious and actually help you to restore the traumatic events from the childhood because sometimes we don't even know why the physical uh, problem is when we go into our subconscious, our subconscious tells us, takes us into that event when it happened. And you, it's almost like a psychotherapy like when you go in, in a hypnotic state, you go into your subconscious and you restore that event. So that's what I've been, uh, I'm going to do the next thing. Because as much as I love working with energies, Again, then we go back into our lives and dealing with our mind. And if we have not yes. dealt with the traumas, um, then um, it would be very difficult to stay in those high vibrations. Uh, yeah. It would be work. 
it yeah. would be every day. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So Thank my, you for my this. pardon. Thank you for asking this question. Pleasure, pleasure. Okay, so be, before we started recording, we had a very brief chat, and I'd like to revisit that now on the recording, if possible. Obviously, as we're speaking, we're recording this in April 2022, and as we both know, there's a not pleasant event taking place in the world in Ukraine at the moment, where Russia has invaded Ukraine, and very sad things are happening in the world. And as you're Russian, and obviously you know that country, you were born in that country, although you've lived now away for over 24 years from that country. Um, I'd love to know your perspective and how the work that you're doing and the things that you're learning can help people, not just people that are involved there, but also people as myself, as observers, how can we deal with you know, the gravity of what's happening and the sadness that we all feel in our hearts for what's happening? So I actually, as you mentioned, I have been an observer myself since I live in the United States and I observed the situation. I spoke with my relatives in Russia. As you know, I work with uh, um, um, Ukrainian family. I see their side and I see how Russians um, mind works. And I also know the culture as well and the whole historical events that, that, yes. that brought us here into this place. Uh, what I see is again we talked about ego. We we see the def we see the pain on one side and we see the defenseness defensiveness of the ego on the other side. Of course, nobody wants no not every Russian. I felt very weird to be Russian. I felt like shamed and blamed for things that I personally did not do. But because yes. I'm Russian, I should feel this pain. And, and blame for what um, the government had chose to go with. Um, so what I have been doing and what I have had learned from um, Marie Diamond, who is, she wrote a foreword to uh, the book that I co-wrote, my first book, um, that was um, a collaborative project as well, that's called, um, um, it's a long, it's a long uh, name. Um, uh, paid forward series notes to your younger self. She wrote forward. I met her in England, and then recently, I was in the on the clubhouse in the room that um, someone hosted with her. And the amazing thing that I opened up for myself, and that's what I would like to tell people to do, is in order to change, change the events that are happening right now in the world on the metaphysical level, um, take care of your own heart first, forgive yourself, uh, open up your heart space. And from that space of forgiveness, love, you can send the peace and love to both sides of the country, of the countries, yes, to the Ukrainians and to the Russians. And that's what Marie did. She did this meditation where you forgive yourself, where you open up your heart space, and then you send that energy. And that's how metaphysics works. And that's, that's the only thing I can share with you about that. Thank you very much. And, and, and I'm sorry that you're having this kind of, you know, shame blame stuff floating around it is very uh, difficult yes such a yeah. difficult shocking experience for both sides yeah sure yeah. because there is never in these situations there will never be a winner or a loser everybody loses and yes and the, the horrible stuff you can't go back and redo it it's like no. okay it's done what do you do now yeah so that's the most difficult part so. I know, I know. It's it's a it's a really really big lesson for the world mm -hmm. as a whole, and especially I believe as 
well, technically we're still going through a pandemic, but you could say we're almost coming out of it because people are so relaxed about it now. Um, you know, we haven't even had a chance to recover from that properly and do, as you say, forgive ourselves and, you know, have the heart be in our heart space over that. Um, and then on top of that, immediately afterward, we've got another big event that has happened. And therefore, people's emotions are even heightened to such a level that it spills over. Um, and let's just set the intention that it's going to end really, really soon. And if we can all hold on to that intention and send that energy out to that part of the world, and even in our own cities and towns and countries where there's a lot of blame and shame and all of that going on, just for that to be healed and, and resolved now. And as there is no linear time and we're living in a quantum world where everything happens at the same time, we can set that intention and it's done. Um, and it can end right here, right now. And I would encourage you to not to think as our limiting brain, you know, puts everything in a box. Don't think that this act is too small to do. It's actually mm -hmm. really, really big on a metaphysical level. It is the amazing thing that you could do to help this world because the healing starts from uh, on each individual level. Mm -hmm. And from that level, you can transform the world, I believe, you know. Thank you, Olga. That's wonderful. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry we spent such a long time, but there's some important things you've shared with our listeners today. I really appreciate it. How can people get in touch with you? How can they find you? So you can find me on any social media and Instagram. I'm The Return. On um, Facebook, I am The Return to My Feminine Self. You can uh, contact me directly. Um, I have a website that's called um, The Return to My Feminine Self. Today. So you can uh, look me up and look for the next projects and for the books that I feel would be so amazing to help people people with their own traumas so that book would be amazing so look up um, the post that I will be posting soon so and thank you for the listeners thank you for being here and thank you for asking such great questions because they're so important for so many people at this time well I, I really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom and knowledge uh, I think this is a really really timely interview I wish you massive success with all your new projects. Do keep me posted. And if you're ever in the United Kingdom, let me know. Um, maybe we can try and meet up somehow. And um, thank you so much. Take care. Yes, yes, for sure. And thank you for the invite. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.